We apologize for this brief interruption in the show. As many of you likely know, the Higher Standard Podcast is officially sponsored by Transcend Company. Transcend has been my longtime provider for both testosterone and peptide therapies, but they offer so much more. Whether you're interested in health, wellness, or longevity, it all begins with you getting your blood work done. A lab draw will help you get the numbers and establish your baseline. You can go to transcendcompany.com slash THSP. That's transcendcompany.com slash THSP. Or you can click the link in the show notes on any streaming platform and on YouTube. Fill out your information and one of the representatives will contact you to get your journey started today. Now back to the show. So they're going to uh, bring you in for a deposition on that Diddy trial? <laughs> You're going to jump right into that? Really? <laughs> it's out the gate? Right now, baby. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say what America has not said. What? Are you sure? Yeah, I'm going to say it. And I, I recognize this is probably going to be a trigger. Trigger alert for everybody out there. Trigger alert. Okay. Um, if your house, God forbid, ever gets raided by anybody for sex trafficking. Wait, uh, multiple houses. Just a, well, I, I know that you have a lot of houses. But <laughs> in this example, if your house site ever gets raided, okay, much less your house in Los Angeles and your house in Miami, the same time mm -hmm. by the federal authorities. For sex trafficking. Yeah. Okay. Not drug possession. Not no. guns. Trafficking of people for sex. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And you were spotted on your private plane going from Los Angeles to Miami and then pacing outside of a private airport in a really weird fashion. And then you get on your private plane, which is fully fueled up, and go to Antigua. I'm just going to say it, America, that's a bad look. It's an extremely bad look. He's clearly going over there for protection. There's no, there's no, okay, look, you could say, hey, I had, I had a vacation planned and I decided to still go. Yeah. Your homes have been raided by federal authorities for sex trafficking. I want you to know if this ever happens to you, Chris, I am not your lifeline. Delete my phone number. That's it. Oh, did I ever, not... did I ever tell my Warren Sapp story? No, we got to get into that. We're going to yeah. get into it later in the show, though. The reason why we don't speak anymore is because I told him I am not your lifeline. Oh, yeah. wow. How funny. Yeah. I am not getting you out of jail this time. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. There you go. And now yeah. it's out there for the public. Welcome back to the show, everybody. This week, we got a special topic that we want to get into that we feel like will be extremely valuable for you, not only you, but your family as well. Uh, we want to get into uh, trust, revocable trust, irrevocable trust, things of that nature. Having a trust can be important and valuable for several reasons, especially in terms of estate planning and even asset protection. You practiced that, didn't you? No, I mean, this guy's right. I, no, you practiced that. A little bit. That was right. a little just, bit of a just, mirror. Just a little yeah. bit, yeah. And we want to get into why it's important for you, why you absolutely need it. I mean, you're clearly um, tuning into a financial literacy podcast. You're hoping to grow your wealth over time. And as time goes on, you absolutely will need this to protect yourself and your family. All right. So for context, I think it's important to really kind of dive down into why we feel like speaking on this topic is relevant to you. It is not naturally what I would call a financial vehicle to most. It's an asset protection vehicle, which does have its arm in the context of financial wealth building. Right. So as underwriters, uh, me formally, side currently uh, by trade, we see a lot of wealthy people's financials. And one of the reoccurring themes that we started to see over time was there was a consistent trend of people having trust. As a matter of fact, you probably heard that one of the most common assets or vehicles for people to hold their assets in real estate world or in our LLCs because you have a passive income benefit and you can write down certain things that really benefit you. So LLCs are the most common vehicle to hold investment real estate across the country. Trusts are how people hold their interest in the LLC. Exactly. So if, if the LLC owns, let's just say, uh, we'll use a real estate property as the asset tool um, in this example, the LLC owns the property outright 100%. Your your trust, your family trust, or your living trust will own 100% of that LLC. So they start to layer it. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of give you some of the benefits of these things. And we're going to explain to you some of the nuances that we've seen over time. But I must tell you, caveat here, I am a licensed and practicing attorney. This is not legal advice. You should seek counsel for your own legal needs. But I am going to give you some um, general theoretical legal advice, which may or may not pertain to you. Right. This was definitely one of those things for me, like you mentioned earlier, that as as an underwriter over the years, you know, we see the formula, part of the formula of how, you know, 
the rich get become wealthy and right. they you know maintain their wealth and establish their wealth. And this is one of those recurring themes that we would I would constantly see that every single person would have a trust, a family trust, a living trust um, that they would typically hold some, if not all, of their assets in. So let's walk through the lifeline of some terminology and explain to you some of the differences of things you're probably going to hear. Mm -hmm. Typically speaking, most people during their lifetime create a trust that is built for their lifetime or inter vivos during their lifetime, right? There's some Latin language here. It's from law school. It's an old habit for me to get rid of. Just know it's a trust that you create as a vehicle in your lifetime. That is generally revocable, meaning that if you say, hey, I have the Said family trust, but I want to make changes to it. You can change anything you want during your lifetime. Mm-hmm. Upon your death, if you were the only person who made the trust, it then becomes irrevocable, meaning that you cannot change what has been put in place by you. Yeah, it shifts over, right? It shifts over. From being revocable to irrevocable. Now, if you if you get, let's say you get a trust, because there's all, place, all kinds of places now where you can get trust, right? If you go to a, a good attorney that specializes in this, right? They're going to ask you a series of questions, some of them that you've never thought of or never thought you needed to think about, Mm -hmm. right, that you start to plan. And then a really good one may uh, will allow you to come back and check in every few years or ever so often to now update this revocable trust. Yeah, and it is kind of a money grab in some cases by attorneys. Let's be honest about that. In other cases, it's uh, technology has been you know, deplacing this this need for a long time. Mm-hmm. I really like Sal from Mind Pump's Cousins program, GetDynasty.com, where he does this for you and has a follow-up built up into it. It's actually kind of fantastic for getting started. The cost is relatively innocuous compared to some of the legal uh, costs I've seen from traditional attorneys, but... The, the main thing you need to do if you go through this process, whether you're using something, something like Get Dynasty or, you know, you're going to an attorney or you're doing it yourself on LegalZoom, which I do not advise, you need to be able to ask yourself the hard questions. And a great example is, Saeed, what's going to happen to your kids if you die? Yeah, and that really – and you can imagine how, you know, this answer will change over the years as they continue to get older. It does. Right? Yeah. So right now, if something were to happen to me, I would need to – Make sure I need to figure out who's going to take guardianship over them, right? Mm -hmm. And as time goes on, let's just say I need to update it. Now they're 18 years old, but I know they're actually not financially financially literate yet. Um, I need to protect the assets from them to make sure that they don't run the whole empire down to the ground, right? So, And as time goes on, you can continue to modify these things. So I will point out there are special and unique trusts that are out there. You can hear about them, Delaware Statutory Trust, you know, all sorts of unique variations like that. I'm not going to get into the, the nuances of each each one, but suffice it to say that those are wrong for about 99.9% of people. Absolutely. If you have a tax need or somebody from an estate planning purpose that really tells you that you need a certain trust and tells you the benefits, that's a different story. But for most of America, just creating a simple living trust that you can change during your lifetime will help you do things like avoid probate. Yes, and so, this, this is massive. Yeah, right? Probate has tax consequences. A lot of tax consequences, and it really holds the assets that, let's just say, um, if if I were to pass away at some point in time in the future, and um, I have assets that I want to pass down to my kids, and I don't have a trust, and now these assets need to go through probate. It takes, on average, 18 months for those assets to transfer over to my kids because it goes into this whole probate process. The probate process is basically a court getting involved, yeah. a judge going, okay, Said passed. He has X, Y, and Z assets. He did not leave a will or a living trust. And in mm-hmm. doing so, we're going to decide where his money goes and to whom. They need it. So what happens is, let's say I have several investment properties, right? By that time, hopefully, right? That's the goal. Mm-hmm. They need. They contact all the creditors and they let them know that I passed away, and they need to make sure that all the debts are paid. Well, they're going to name a trustee uh, who does that. On their behalf. Right, on their to, behalf. To settle the estate. Yeah, but you can imagine it's it's being handled by the court and how many people are passing away, how many how many uh how like how many assets are getting going through probate. That's why this process takes a long time. So they want to make sure all your taxes are paid. They want to make sure that all debts are paid off, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why they say typically on average 18 months for it to eventually get to my my heirs, as they call it. So let's define some terms here. If I create a trust, I am the trust store. Right? Yes. I created the trust. My wife and I created a trust. We are both trustors. If we are in control of the trust, like during our lifetime, 
We are also both the trustees. Yes. We have a fiduciary responsibility to the trust to preserve its assets as trustees. In 99% of the cases for people who are doing this for their trust, for their living trust, myself and my wife are going to create trust as trustors, and we're also going to be the trustees. However, you can name trustees that move into place upon your death, and most trusts do this, right? So Mm -hmm. in the event that I die... I would like Saeed to be my trustee. So my wife and I would name Saeed as trustee in the event of our death. And then instead of the court naming somebody to handle the estate, Saeed would then step in and handle the estate. And I would handle the estate and I would follow the trust to the T. So I would make sure that everything gets handled exactly the way Chris and uh, Joanna had written out exactly how they wanted it to get handled. Right. So I think the ownership of trust, generally speaking, has the... um, the logical fallacy of privacy. Unfortunately, for most people, they do the same reoccurring thing. And a lot of attorneys encourage this, and I never truly understood why. Interesting. They'll say, hey, Saeed, name your trust the Saeed Omar Living Trust. <laughs> Just a Or second. the Omar Family Living Trust. You know, you know, when I get a trust, it's going gonna, it's not, it's gonna to be some, something fly. It can't just be the Saeed Omar or the Omar Family Trust. Kobe Day Forever Trust. <laughs> Come on, all day, every day? Yeah, I mean. Yeah. But that THS? Goes, yeah, well. So my family trust is actually the CMN family trust. Okay. Right? My my initials. And I had this before I got married. Um, so one of the things to think about is, this is a great example of it. I had the CMN, my initials, family trust. And I chose that name specifically because it didn't have my last name in it. Yes. Which I'm doing no, no service to right now to protect the privacy. Right. Um, and the reason why I chose that name is it was ambiguous enough, but still close enough to where I felt like that was a good name. But you can name it anything you want. Most people just choose their family name because it's a family trust. That being said, I've got married. I've got two choices at that point in time. I could amend my trust, right? So I could have the CMN family trust dated the date that I created it, amended on whatever date I amended it. Right. So you often see this language in reference to trust. So if I didn't amend it, CMN Family Trust created on January 1 of 2023. But let's say I got married in February. CMN Family Trust amended in February. Right. Right? Or I can do something known as a complete restatement. Right? So let's just say, you know what? The trust was good for what I needed it for, but now I'm married. Now there's more complexities. We've got a son. Rather than try to amend this, we're just going to completely restate the entire trust. Right. So that'll be the CMN family trust restated and then the, the the date. And one thing to really keep in mind here is by doing by doing something like this, you're being proactive, right? Yes, Chris mentioned that it is a money grab by, you know, attorneys out there. But really a you're really saving- good attorney, it's not a money grab. Just keep in mind there's you don't have if nothing changed tan- you know, tangibly in the in the year, mm-hmm. then you don't have to go in and talk to your attorney. Right, exactly. Um, but definitely you're saving a lot. You're saving, you know, the people that the assets are being transferred over to, you're saving them a lot of money, you know, on the back end because of, you know, estate planning and the, you don't have to pay the capital gains taxes, right? Yeah, well, as you get older, one of the things you'll find that really helps avoid tax liability is actually passing these assets on to your children during your lifetime. Mm-hmm. vis-a-vis the trust yeah and there's a couple benefits here that people don't think about from a, just a human perspective number one you get to see your kids enjoy the monetary benefit during your lifetime okay number two there's a tax benefit to them getting it during their lifetime and you can help them with the taxes so upon your death they're not just getting hit with this whirlwind of emotions obviously you're gone right. and oh by the way i've got to deal with these financial consequences as a result of it and i'm changing my life by adding x y and z elements to it as per your trust Right. So it's a lot more humane, I hate to say, to describe it that way, if you start passing assets along before you actually die. Uh, but there's a lot more that goes into trust people don't think about. I mean, keep in mind there's an asset protection here. Your trust is a separate entity than you. It has its, it has its own social security number, a tax ID number. Well, most people will actually attach it to their own tax ID number. Right, but it could. You right? can get a separate tax ID number from the government and right. treat it as a separate vehicle. Most people don't want to do that because they don't want to file a separate tax return for their trust. So they file it as a statement attached to their current tax return as a family trust. Exactly. And, you know, for tax purposes, that that's fine. You also insulate yourself because a trust is treated separately. So you still get the same benefit, even though it shows up on your tax return as just an extension of you. 
very similar to an S corp, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what I think is really, really important here that I think people miss is that life happens fast, right? You set this up and you say, okay, I don't own anything besides my primary residence. Do I need this? Yes, you do. Yes. Okay. Chris, I, I don't own a primary residence. I just have a couple of bank accounts and I'm learning. I've got a kid. Do I need this? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Chris, uh, it's just me. I don't have any kids. I don't have any assets yet. I'm learning and growing. Do I need this? No, you don't absolutely need it. Is it a good practice to have it? Yes. Mm -hmm. In the event that you die, do you really want the legislative system determining where ha what happens? Do you really want your mom, your dad, your nephews, your, your, whoever's going to benefit from you, you from your passing, whoever's going to be related to you to, to get that or has a claim to it? Right. Do you really want them to have to go through a, a separate process, or do you want to make it as streamlined as possible? People say, well, Chris, I'm young. I'm not going to die. My wife and I to this day, still question whether we should fly on the same flight with that whenever our son's at home and we're going somewhere on our own. Because when you think about if that plane goes down, we're both gone. I mean, uh, no different than, you know, the president and the vice president never can be on the same flight or executives at yeah, exactly. yeah, corporations, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's just redundancy. I would say a trust functions in much of the same way. It, it gives you the redundancy, the coverage, that in the worst case event scenario, something happens. But people forget that life happens quickly. You could not own a piece of real estate, buy a piece of real estate, and not think about the trust. It's easy. It's easy to think, right, um, that everything's fine. And but he, like we all know, it could all be taken away tomorrow. And in my in my opinion, what better thing to give? Let's just say your loved ones. Let's say you you do have assets and you want to pass it on. What better thing to give them than like they now all of a sudden have all these assets that you know you've now given mm -hmm. them, but have no idea how to control it. You can establish a property management company for them so they know who to go to you can show you can control the distribution of the assets so like i think i know i think Shaq said something once that he he his kids aren't gonna get anything unless they get two degrees like you can go that far Sha Shaq is a very underrated like intelligent entrepreneur well you know what what makes him i think um so intelligent is he he knows when he needs to just listen and trust others and delegate the process I wish Arun was like that. <laughs> he is like that. What do you mean? <laughs> Arun, welcome back to the show, brother. It's, Thank you, sir. It's been a long time. We we missed you, and I'm taking shots because I'm emotionally still reeling from your absence. We, we have missed you a lot. I apologize. Family stuff taken care of. Yeah. I thought we were family. I, did I miss that part of the relationship? No, no. We're all fa we are family. I feel like I didn't read the room right on that. <laughs> <laughs> Odu's been, Odu's been taking care of some stuff, and maybe maybe on a future episode we'll we'll get into it. We'll leave it up to him. Basically, saying he doesn't want to hear about your shit right now. No, it's not true. I, was, I didn't want to put him on the spot and be like, and be like, no, nah, I really don't want to share. You just, you just assume that he's not not sharing. Uh, no, I don't. What do you mean? I'm not assuming. I just don't want to for, force him. All right. Well, before we leave the trust episode, uh, there or the trust segment of this episode, I do want to cover a couple nuances that over the years I think are important for people to understand. If you're going to get a loan on your home. A lot of agency lenders, your Fannie, Freddie's, if you're going to get a, a loan on your home, they'll tell you, hey, Chris, uh, the property that you're buying has to go into your name and then uh, contemporaneous with closing, at the same time of closing your property, we'll also put it into your trust name, which then eliminates the privacy because someone can search title records and find your name and then it's going into a trust and they go, oh, well, Chris owns this trust because it went from him directly into this trust. Yes. Now they just search the trust name and they find all your properties. To avoid that, you can work with smaller lenders that'll go directly into the trust name, mm. right? Or, frankly, you can try not to put certain properties into your trust when you want to keep them separate. Yeah, I've heard that some lenders, if the property's held under a trust, they won't even give you, like, a HELOC. Correct, yeah. It, it's bizarre. Well, HELOCs right now, they're just trying to find ways not to do them because... Yeah. They're really concerned about the housing market and valuations. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot. Of, so it originally started with like you know we're not going to go behind somebody else's first trustee. So if Wells Fargo made the first trustee, you had to go to Wells Fargo to get a second trustee. Mm -hmm. What if Wells Fargo stopped making them? Right. You know, second trustees, which they did for a while, mm -hmm. and I think they still still haven't. But um, you know, you get you gotta gotta play that game a little bit. But there's there's some idiosyncrasies that are there. Once your trust goes from revocable, meaning that you can change at any point in time, to irrevocable. It becomes much more difficult for people to get loans associated with that type of ownership. Yes. And the reason why is that irrevocable trust is now an independent 
you know, kind of functioning entity, mm -hmm. right? And it is functioning based on the testator, the person who died, the the, the trustor's intentions. And now mm -hmm. that person's gone. That person can't change the intentions. So it's generally speaking, you can't provide a guarantee as a beneficiary for an irrevocable trust to most lenders. Right. And something else that I really want to make sure that um, I touch on uh, before we move on is when I was doing my research on this topic, that just because you have a will does yeah. not mean it won't go into probate, right? Um, and not only that, I believe the will document will become um, pu a public document in that case. Well, not only that, but a will is not the same thing, right? Yes. So. You typically get a will and a living trust, but in my mind, a will just gives a directive, do X, Y, and Z. A living trust has more value. Yeah. And there, there's some kind of weird nuances to the difference, but suffice it to say, if you go to a good attorney or a good website, they'll give you a living trust and a will, a last will and testament. Yeah. Right? The, the living trust is by far the better vehicle. Um, a will just says, hey, do X, Y, and Z. It's very, it's very delineated. It's very clear. It's kind of like just directions. Right. Whereas a living trust is like a roadmap. Mm -hmm. Rudimentary, but effectively speaking, anyone who gives you a living trust should be also throwing in a will as well. Right. And one other added benefit that I did read about, because I know that um, the divorce rate in this country is very high. What is it right now? Do you know? Uh, I think it's over 50%. California has got to be over like 77%, right? It's got to be something crazy. I mean, Maroon. You got to Google that. Gotta, What's the divorce rate in, in California? Yeah. Wow. After, after Very reach, Jamie of you pulling that right already up. Already had it up. After reaching a 40-year record low for two consecutive years, 2020 and 2021, at 14 divorces per 1,000 married women, the divorce rate rose slightly in 2022 to 14 and a half divorces per 1,000 married women. Uh, what about, what, what's the divorce rate in the in California? Let's try that. Yeah. Let's look at that up. Oof. This means that only those... 75 people out of 1,000 will be divorced in California. What's that chart to the right there? California has a 60% divorce rate. Damn. Yeah. So yeah, above 50%. So this is um, having a trust is one way to ensure, hopefully you, you and your family don't have to deal with this, but it's one way to ensure that your children from a previous marriage are included in, you know, passing, on, passing up those assets. You know, I don't – I was thinking about this over the weekend – my wife and I were talking about somebody that we know uh, that's moved on to a second marriage. Mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't do it. It would be extreme. I, I, I mean, I my wife my wife and I, we already talked about it. I was like, there's no way. For, I don't, for me, there's no way. Like, I would have no desire to do that again. <laughs> yeah. It's like. <laughs> like no, I, mean, I don't mean it like in the negative content. Okay, that sounds bad. <laughs> uh, no, no. I, don't, I, I, don't even, like I was going to try to save it, but I couldn't even know how to save no, it. No, no. I, I just. I mean, look. Marriage is work. It's a partnership, right? Right. Like, what What are you saying about, I mean, I understand some marriages are bad, some marriages you're young, blah, blah, blah. But when you're married and you have a kid, like, I, I know people get married again and they have more kids and they find love and all those things. Like, I just, I got to be honest, man. Like, I don't think I'd want to do it again with somebody else. For me, and this is, I mean, okay, prisoner of the moment, you can say that, right? But for me, knock on wood, marriage has been so great that I can't even envision it being any better. <laughs> That's just the truth, man. I'm not even fronting here. Said Omar, world's greatest husband. <laughs> That's not father. true. I'm just being honest. When he's not coaching his kids sports and <laughs> being the world's greatest father. Oh, my father, God. By the way, by the way. the world's greatest husband, America. In case, in case he ever does come back and listen to these episodes. Who? Arun? Uh, no, Adam. Uh. This past weekend. Uh, down one point, gets fouled with like a couple seconds left in the game, goes to the free throw line, knocks down the free throw to send it into overtime. Who? Adam. Your son? Uh, yeah, dude. It was it was remarkable. But he, I, so, but then guess what? He missed the second one. So I pulled him after the game, and we ended up winning the game, but I pulled him after the game. I was like, you made the hard one. You missed the easy one. What happened? Oh. So anyways, I was really, really proud of him. And he, honestly, he went up there. He didn't feel the pressure at all. Stepped up, did his routine, knocked it down. You know, I'm sick, so maybe my judgment's a little off here, but this wholesome version of you is such bullshit. What do you mean? Oh, it's such, not, it's it, such no, bullshit. don't be that guy. No, no, I know, I know you're proud. I think I just broke the chair. <laughs> we did, this is your way of wanting new chairs? You've uh, been sending me chairs. You're like, let's get these. No, nah, man. Okay, you know, before we get into the show, well, you know what? Let's just, let's, let's, 
Let's get into the show, and then let's get before we get into the real show. I have to admit something. Oh, that's right. Let's get into yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. So, welcome back to the Higher Standard Podcast, the number one financial literacy podcast in the world. Sitting next to me, as you have probably surmised by now, the Sur- one and only Said Omar. S A T vocabulary. Surmise, bro. Yeah. Not bad. Thank you, my man. Sitting next to me on my left, my partner in crime, Chris Nahibi. Welcome back to the show, everybody. And lovingly and affectionately, softly touching the ones and twos, the man, the myth, the legend has returned to us. DJ Arun, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the show, man. Feels good, man. Feels good. I, I don't feel like your energy level. He had a stinky pinky, all. and then he had yeah, other there, stuff. I did cover that on the episode. <laughs> yeah, 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 and then he, it's been a rough last three weeks. Yeah, <laughs> the stinky pinky played into that, or yeah, yeah, yeah. stinky pinky. Pink eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does not help to have two kids that are in daycare. Yeah, exactly. Is there is there trouble in daycare paradise? I hope not. I mean, my kids were the only ones that got pink eye, but. Oh, they did. I thought I was being sarcastic. No, oh. but what do you mean? We called him. We called him having a stinky pinky. No, I thought he legitimately had stinky pinky. I didn't think it was like a euphemism for pink eye. Oh yeah, yeah it's very confusing with you. <laughs> it's, it's, you never know. You yeah. coined it, man. I know I did. <laughs> Bro, that happened. Stomach flu for you had the, the stomach flu. No, the wife and Mariam. So you gave him the stomach flu? No, no, Mariam got it from school and then gave it to my wife and. Yeah, it's it's who, wild. Who, who then Hawa ended up getting? Yeah, then Hawa ended up getting it too. And you didn't get it, dude. I'm immortal, bro. Like, I'm don't do that. Knock this shit, you don't want that. You better knock on some phase, wood, bro. You don't phase, want that car. Yeah, you're, not gonna, <laughs> 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 you're gonna get stomach flu next week for sure. Hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Pooping your brains out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, so I sat here. Uh, I think it was last show, and I said to you that you know I'm not really fat and I'm lean. I'm probably around 11 percent body fat. Like you know, I'm proud of myself. Same here. Yeah. 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 Well, unfortunately, ruined this closer to not true for both of us than you know. <laughs> I um, I haven't been getting on the scale, but I've been working out hard. Right. And uh, you know, I take uh, I took Matsi, I took uh, Tessafenzine from uh, our friends over at Transcend. And for those of you who don't recall, we are sponsored by Transcend. You can go to transcendcompany.com/thsp. Great way to help support the show. And uh, they'll hook you up. I'm actually taking some of their facial cream right now, which is not the reason my face looks like complete ass. And yeah. The reason I look like ass is I'm sick. But, uh, yeah, so I uh, I knew I was I weighed a lot before, but I had cut down. I, I felt good, mm-hmm. you know? Clothes were fitting better. Clothes were fitting better, and, and I felt pretty good about myself. And then I got on the scale uh, this last weekend. I was like, huh. <laughs> huh. That number seems large. Um. I go back to September of last year, and according to the scale, not only my body fat, my weight is exactly the same, exactly the same. Okay, the, the whole body fat percentage on the scale thing, I don't trust that. Yeah, I know. I know you're gonna say that. Okay, so <laughs> I, um, you know, this is a Saturday. And I'm huh. by Monday, I've already got a DEXA scan scheduled for twelve thirty that day. I'm gonna get the full. Wait, explain to people what a DEXA scan is. I know it's a lot level... of our listeners are from Mind Pump, Mind Pump, Mind Pump. They yeah. know, but low level radiation. But basically, you're gonna get a full scan. Think of it as like a full body X-ray, giving you a full look at your tissue type, muscle fat, and your bone density. Everything. It's the best way uh, to look at look the at the most data. accurate by far. Right. Okay. So, Daddy went and did that, and um, I am happy to report I am fatter than ever. No, it's not true, man. Yeah, I've g- I've gained twenty pounds of muscle. If any, if anything, that just means you were because uh, you didn't get a DEXA scan last year. No, I haven't had one in five years. Okay, so that, then you were probably no, no, no. My last DEXA scan was so. If you go back five years, my last one before that, um, I was like two hundred pounds, two hundred four. No, no, no. So you put on a lot of muscle mass. I'm two hundred and fifty something right now. Yeah. If you go back six years ago, after I went through a bulking phase. I was almost exactly the same weight. The scale was not wrong. Wow. And to make matters worse, my visceral fat, the fat around my organs, has doubled. It's the highest it's ever been. Holy, that's that's scary. Yeah, I'm still well below, like, bad. Like, I'm still in a very healthy range. But for me, doubled. Yes. Right? And um, the uh, number one place that I've gained uh, body weight, my stomach <laughs> and my love handles. Yeah. And um, it's always the last place to go, right? This wholesome Indian, like former nurse, turns to me and goes, "Yeah, I don't know how to tell you this in a nice way, so I'm just gonna tell you. You need to lose weight, boy. You thick." That's what she said. And I was like, "Why are you being so mean about it?" She's like, "Because I've got several years here of you being in incredibly good shape, 
So I know you know you let go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why, why did you let go, Chris? And she walks me through the metrics, and I finally was like, stop, 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 stop. Okay. I've been working out hard for six months. So whatever it was, it was worse before today. Absolutely. And she goes, well, if you want a, a sunny side to this story, you did put on 20 pounds of muscle in a matter of a year and a half. Which is impressive for somebody that's been working out for as long as you have. I mean, for someone who's just starting out, maybe a little bit more reasonable, maybe like 10 pounds, 15 pounds at most. But 20 pounds is a lot, dude. Yeah. Uh, but she said, you're also still fat. Dude, you put on 20 more pounds of muscle? That means I had 164 you, pounds dude, what, of lean what, muscle what, to 184 point something. So wait, are you now are you back to weighing in every week? Yeah. Have to, right? Here's the problem. Is I've done so much metabolic damage. I'm eating 1,800 calories a day, 225 grams of protein. And dude, I feel like that's not enough. There's no way that's enough. There's no way that's enough. I'm still not losing weight, dude. Dude, that's so you got to reverse diet. It's been two weeks. The problem with reverse dieting is I'm going to gain weight before I lose weight. Yeah, but that's... but. That's what you have to do. That's why I took two years off and got fat in the first place. I was reverse dieting. No, but you weren't tracking. Like, you got to really reverse diet. Sometimes, Saeed, you got to take the L. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, dude, you're not going to accept this for the rest of your life. I'm not yep. going to let you do that. I Join am. the fat side, Chris. <laughs> it's so much more fun over Rune, here. <laughs> I missed you, and my body has been craving you so much <laughs> so that much? I'm morphing into you. No, well, no, no, I no, was no. I was going to bring burritos, but you were sick, so I thought you couldn't eat a burrito. Wouldn't you get a burrito for me because I'm sick? Yeah, you need the comfort food. Yeah. Is that where's, that? The, where's the logic? So do you eat less when you're sick? Because it doesn't look yeah. like right. <laughs> <laughs> Top takeaways for tonight's show. Happen to be a couple conversations we're going to listen in on from Jerome Powell. A little thing called the FOMC meeting happened in the press conference afterward. Well, JP sounded a little less JP than normal this time. What he's saying is not really aligning up with the narrative all along. No, he's uh, he slipped the script a little bit. A little, a little bit. A lot of it. We're going to play a clip from that. We're also going to talk about the Federal Reserve posting a record loss, little tiny dollar amount of $114 billion in the year of 2023. What does that mean? That means the U.S. Treasury won't be getting additional money this year. We're going to do some chart work, and we're going to get into that. Mohammed al Rain, one of our favorite economists, uh, well, he has an article uh, which shows a rush of money has hit the U.S. corporate bond markets in 2024. Mm. Uh, kind of fulfilling the prophecy that our future Nobel laureate, Saeed Omar, has always expressed concern about the uh, U.S. corporate market is under some stress. They need some, they need some dollars. They need a little bit of help. Yeah. Then we're going to get into the chart of the day. Average rate for the U.S. savings accounts has actually come down. <laughs> you want to you know how big of a nerd I am? So when I got Instagram for this show, right, however many months ago it was, mm-hmm. you so I, I think the first person I followed was was uh, you and then obviously the podcast. And then um, and then I did like a bunch of comedians that I like to follow, right? Yeah. And then the very next thing I did was Chart of the Day. I just saw how much I love the Chart of the Chart Day. Chart of the Day is great. I love it's Chart a, of the Day. visual. Yeah. Chart work's my favorite work. Yeah. We will round out the show if there's time with Kobisi Letter on home prices and real estate stocks sliding following landmark related decisions from the last episode. So you know... Triply know for sure that Arun does not listen to the show. <laughs> oh, we're going we're gonna to prove it up. But if you're listening to the show on Apple or Spotify, please head over and leave us an honest five-star review. It does a lot for the show. It means a lot to each and every single one of us. If you're watching this over on YouTube, please make sure you subscribe, hit that notification bell, and make sure you smash that like button. Let's get this video out to as many people as possible. Make sure you do all the moist, goody good sassafras. Pause threw me off a little bit. Like a I did because I looked at you. I wanted you, wanted you to see if I was going to stumble. No, I was. I was uh, actually getting ready to say what I was going to say. This clip uh, from Yahoo Finance talks about the FOMC press conference top takeaways uh, from the conference that took place on March 20th. As you likely already know, they left rates unchanged. This was widely expected to be the decision. But let's listen to Uncle JP pop off. And give us all cap and no facts. Yeah. C decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged. Our securities holdings have declined by nearly $1.5 trillion since the committee began reducing our portfolio. The, the overall picture really is strong labor market. The extreme imbalances that we saw in the early parts of the pandemic recovery have mostly been resolved. The labor market's in, it's in good shape. You do see things like the low, uh, the low hiring rate. And people have made the argument that if if layoffs were to increase, uh, that that would 
that would mean that the net would be fairly quick increases in unemployment. So that's something we're watching, but we're not seeing it. My instinct would be that rates will not go back down to the very low levels that we saw where all around the world there were long-run rates that were at or below zero uh, in some cases. I, I don't see rates going back down to that level, but I think there's tremendous uncertainty around that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So let's be clear here about Uncle JP. This is the most honest tickle shits I've ever, has ever been. Okay. Really? Yeah, you think so? Oh, yeah, because you know what you know what he's saying? Rates ain't ever going back down. <laughs> Why didn't you say that a year and a half ago, Chiefy? Yeah, right. You know, I got every realtor out there. Realtor out there was talking about, "Hey, man, we're gonna see rates are gonna be cut. Rates are gonna be cut. Blah blah blah." That's the key. That's a key thing to take away. Rates are not going back down. The ten-year Treasury is gonna stay where it's at or go higher. Those are your only two options. It ain't coming down a whole lot from where it's at. Really. And if it does, it'll be nominal at best, meaning that you're gonna have your push up on mortgage rates. That's the reality. Okay. Right. Okay. So this is the problem that I had with this whole post-game press conference. Okay. Okay. They said basically that we're going to be data dependent as they've always said. Yeah. Okay. The three data points that they want to look at is inflation. Yeah. Jobs numbers. Yeah. And GDP. Okay. So they're saying if, if inflation comes down, we'll cut rates. All right. Fine. Uh, down to their 2% target handle. If jobs, if there aren't enough jobs out there and unemployment rate goes up, we're going to have to cut rates sooner. Right. And they're saying if GDP, if we start to head towards a recession where we have negative GDP growth, right, then they're going to have to cut rates. But guess what? They're also saying we're still going to cut rates three times this year. Yeah. So it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. All of these things are still like positive, showing no signs of need of needing a rate cut, but you're still going to rate cut. And let's be honest, if we collectively as morons know that the jobs numbers are completely bullshit and have been revised down several times for him to not address it and say, be so bold as to say we might see a rapid cadence in in layoff where the fuck have you been getting your news guy right there have there has been a rapid cadence in layoffs starting last year mm -hmm. and carrying forward yep for him to go uh oh, yeah if we we just we're just not seeing it in the data what right so you're you're just going to completely ignore that everybody's making fun of the BLS and the jobs reports and the revisions down and everyone's going like, wait a minute, I'm seeing all these layoffs. Why isn't this reflected in the numbers anywhere? And then you're seeing all these revisions back down right? because the numbers that are being printed are not actually what we're getting finalized. Nobody's talking about it. And you, as an expert, a subject matter expert, who's using this as one of your two mandates, jobs, mm -hmm. you're going to sit here and tell me, I don't see it. Yeah, I don't see it. Exactly. So the January inflation report and the February inflation report both came in uh, not so not so well. Okay. Not so well. So, and they've said now we're going to be data dependent. Okay. Our next meeting is May 1st. Okay. There is not enough data coming out from now until then that's going to change his mind. So guess, guess what that means? We're going to wait another time. We're going to wait another time. We're going to hold so, and lovingly wait. So, yeah, this is this is their way of foreshadowing. So I think at the time of this meeting, when this meeting came out, or when he was at the post-game press conference, it was there was an 11% chance at a rate cut. Now it's down to like 5%. I know. So <laughs> it's like, holy cow, man. So now you're looking at, you're looking at June or July. I think it's going to be July. I'm, I'm leaning heavily towards July. I'm, it's gonna, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be July, November, December. I'm already calling it. I mean, you do have a laureate in your future. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be there. <laughs> you, you want to be there? I want to be clapping for you the way you clap for your son, you know, when he scores a bucket. When, when you get that laureate. Bucket. Yeah, man. And then I'm going to show everybody photos of you naked. You don't have any of those. Not yet. <laughs> I got time. <laughs> I got time. We got to make a couple of trips. All right. Well, I know that that is not exactly tactile and tangible, but I thought maybe we'd do some chart work here and start off a, a, a very heavy chart episode with um, another Yahoo Finance article. The Federal Reserve said on Tuesday that it officially saw a net negative income of $114.3 billion in 2023, a record loss tied to expenses related to managing the U.S. Central Bank's short-term interest rate target. The loss last year, Arun is 
joyfully i fucking me with moving this chart no he's trying to through. he's trying to help no, you out know, as, know, as, as, so as great slow. as no, gracefully was, as slow. possible but here's the problem that you just created for yourself in post-production you won't be able to take a snapshot of that without having to move that around yeah i can like, it, i, I can read it in the top left corner you know what honestly working with you two is becoming very challenging for me emotionally <laughs> i quit <laughs> again <laughs> you just got back <laughs> Loss last year follows $58.8 billion in net income from 2022, the Fed said. The numbers released were an audited tally following preliminary numbers reported earlier this year. The Fed has stressed repeatedly that net negative income does not impede its ability to operate or conduct monetary policy by law. Mm-hmm. Okay, The Fed hands over any profits over covering um, after. after covering operational expenses to the Treasury. So, great, we made some money. Hand it over to the Treasury. However, the Fed earns income from services it provides the financial system and from interest income on securities it owns. It has entered. Uh, it, is, or fuck, it has earned significant profits over recent years amid very low rates and very large levels of bond holdings. However, what this article doesn't cover is when it posts a negative, what does it do? Yeah. Instead of handing the money over to the Treasury, they post an IOU to themselves. And next year... They'll recap mm. what they lost and pay themselves back to the extent that they can. And if they have any profits, they'll hand over to the treasury. If not, they'll just continue that, that loss carry forward over. So they can lose all the money in the world, in this case, over $114 billion. Like a net operating loss. Exactly. Wow. So I don't think people understand how that works. You want, you want to break that down? I mean, in like people in businesses, you do this. Like well, this is something that I've seen as an underwriter over the years, right? If yeah. if a, a business is able to use the tax code, the tax system in a way to where they can show a loss by writing off X amount of you know expenses, well, they can carry the excess losses over year over year over year, so that you know they don't have to continue to pay taxes. They can offset their taxable income. This is uh, most notably in Trump's history, right? You take a massive loss on something, then what do you do? You carry that loss forward. And you offset your taxable income for the next several years. Yes, exactly. Well, that's effectively what the what the Federal Reserve is doing here. But the Federal Reserve lost a ton of money last year, a ton, mm-hmm. in part because of their own policies. Insane, man. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I mean, look, they're not going to be profitable forever. I mean, like, we know that this process is cyclical. Like, yeah. this is bound to happen. Yeah, sure. Eventually, but like you said, it didn't have. Maybe it didn't have to be to this extent, right? I mean, you. They did act on this late. This whole mess that we're in is their fault. Let's like they're 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 portraying it out like we're trying to fix the problem. Yeah, fix the problem that they caused. But look look at the chart here. There are three elements in the chart. Okay, and I know you're colorblind, so I'm not going to ask you to read this. It's really fucked up. Yeah, I, I only I'm, see two. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there are two different shades of yellow. Okay, sorry, uh, Arun. Since you've got a hot mic and you're close to the image here, there are three different distinct chart. Uh, indicators here. The first one in the in the yellow dot there. Read that one. It says U.S. Treasury. What? Remittance. Remittance. Yeah. We'll work on your English. The second one. Transfer. Sorry. Moving that. Transfer of capital surplus. And the last one. Cost of operations and excess of earnings. So what you'll notice is there has not been uh, a huge amount of capital surplus. Right. Right. There has been uh, remittance every single year going all the way back. Um, uh, for was that, is that quarterly on the bottom? What are the years there? Those are two. Those are years. So the last one's two thousand twenty-three. Okay. Yeah. The first one is. It, uh, the first one is two thousand fourteen. Two thousand fourteen to now, you saw some negative, slight negative in twenty twenty-two. You saw a massive negative in twenty twenty-three. Yeah. What do you think twenty twenty-four is going to be? Yeah, not so good. So, oh, thank you, Arun. Big, big boy pictures. Very helpful. So. If 2024 is equally as negative or greater, Mm -hmm. hundreds of billions of dollars, it'll take years for them to recover. Yeah, hundreds of billions of dollars that is should typically be going over to the government, right? That they actually account for in you know their revenue. What does that ultimately mean? This is why we've routinely said on the show, it's not just you know instances like this where their the revenue that the government makes is actually going to decrease over the next few years, ultimately making us, you know, go further and further into debt because they're going to have to make up that, that money that they're not getting in by getting more debt. And it's, it's, it's just goes to show you that the stress that they're putting in the system. Well, it's, it's, it's putting stress on themselves as well. 
Uh, but let's talk about where else stress is getting in the system. Uh, Mohammed Al Rain, one of our favorite economists. Um, I I don't really normally peruse LinkedIn uh, for a lot of data, and it's just because you got to look. You only got so many places in the day you can go for your data. I typically like uh, X and websites and people that I trust. But I like Mohammed Al Rain, and and uh, this was an interesting one. <laughs> that smile though. Come yeah, on. he's got like a very like uh, ha ha. I'm rich bitch smile going on there. <laughs> he and, does. Yeah, he's like, hey, my mustache is left side is higher. So from the Financial Times article, and I'm quoting here, investors pour money into U.S. corporate bond funds at record rate. Demand to lock in yield helps push spreads on high-yield bonds closer to their tightest level since 2007. Mm. A rush of money has hit the U.S. corporate bond market in 2024. So the take-home here is if you look at the chart, which if you're driving, I want you to envision a beautiful world beautiful calm world where we have this financial prosperity in the system Mm. and then whatever you can think of as a total opposite that's what we're getting right now (laughs) okay (laughs) the bond market is starting to freak out and there's been a rush of money in because people know that cds and the depository rates are going down now okay and the bond market does compete with cds And as the bond market starts to see some lift, right, and the long end of the curve starts to to stretch out, you're going to have people going into the bond market, at in this case, a record rate to buy bond, corporate debts, U.S. government debts, to lock in profits at the highest interest rate they can for the longest period they can. So if you look at the chart that Arun's pulled up, you see relatively, you know, nothing going back several years to 2008. It was almost like the market was dead. Mm -hmm. And then you saw it pick up. and There was extreme swings up and down. Right. And then you saw a lot of runoff from the bond market. People really went into cash. They were concerned. Right, because of what happened during the pandemic. Right. Then what happened? Now people are diving back into this, which is going to create the spread, the the inversion pressure. You got the yield curve inversion where you have a two-year, which is paying more than the 10-year. Right. You're going to start seeing this 10-year now creep up, and you're going to start seeing it level out in response in part to this. Now, that's going to be really interesting because if the Fed is – so at this last FOMC meeting, right, they doubled down on what they said in December, saying that we we still think we're still going to commit to three rate cuts this year. Okay? Yeah, which was an interesting take because I, them doubling down on that uh, was an interesting choice. Now, the, notoriously, the Fed – has a bad prediction of what they're going to do. They generally don't hit what they say they're going to do. That's true. But for them to double down like that was interesting. But it did come at the same time where the market expectation for rate cuts is now aligned with what they're saying. So the market is basically saying with their assumptions of what they think is going to happen that we now believe the Fed. Yeah, we okay, we believe you guys. Sorry, we were wrong. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we get it, JP. You're going to do what you're going to do. Right, exactly. There's nothing, we can't change your mind. So if let's just say there are three rate cuts by the end of the year, that would mean the Fed funds rate right now currently, which is at 5.5%, would be down to 4.75%. Okay? Man, yeah. Okay, so well, that— It feels imaginary, but maybe, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would be—we could all use it, okay? Um, and we'll get into some of these uh, credit card accounts and what their average APRs are right now. And how it may also help them out too. Actually, I was going to go to savings accounts and CDs next. Yeah, but that's credit cards right after that. Yeah, um, I don't read your contributions. <laughs> that's your contribution, dude. I don't read your contributions to the conversation. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if that does happen, right? I get what you're saying here and how this could put upward pressure on the tenure and why you should care about this upward pressure on the tenure. Because if you're hoping for mortgage rates to come down, mortgage rates closely follow what goes on with the 10-year, right? And I I really don't, I know that people think that that's going to happen as a response, an emotional response to the market. I I just don't, I don't see that being a a, a possibility. All the economic pressures that keep these things high are clear. This is not speculation on my part. Like, they're there. Yeah. People have this weird thing like, oh, the Fed's going to cut rates. That means mortgage rates are going to drop. No, it does not. Right. Okay, they're, they're, the bond market in the 10-year treasury in particular is the biggest indicator for mortgage rates. And that ain't going down anytime soon. Really? Okay, so that's what I was thinking. Because I, too, was thinking that if they did cut rates to 4.75% by the end of the year, then naturally the 10-year would also come down. 
which is I get that. I, and there's a lot of people who believe that, and there's a lot of really intelligent and people that I argue with this about a lot. Okay. Um, I know Logan over at Housing Wire has a different of opinion on this, and maybe I'm a little bit too overconfident on it. But let me let me break this down. All right. So if you have a yield curve inversion where people have very little confidence in what's going to happen and far too in the future, right? They're more confident in what's going to happen in the next year or two. They invest heavily in the two-year treasury. Okay. Right? Because they're limited on their on what they're willing to do long-term with their money because they just, they're just unsure. Right. right? So because of that confidence, the two-year starts to go higher and the 10-year starts to go lower. They're just not confident in the long end. Mm -hmm. If the Fed is successful at stabilizing the economy, this Goldilocks scenario, presumptively, you should become increasingly more confident in the long end of the curve. Yes. And as you become more long, confident in the long end of the curve, what you're really saying is, I'm okay investing my money for longer in that longer duration to get more return in the market. Right. That means money going into the two-year will come down as money going into the long end, the 10-year goes up. We're also in an inverted yield curve, which is typically precedes recessionary economies. It's an indicator like all the other warning indicators we've talked about on the show many times. In order to get out of this, there's only a couple different ways this can go. They can either both go, one go down a little bit, and the other one go up a little bit, right? Because the 10-year has to somehow creep above the two-year. Right. The two-year can drop to the floor, or the 10-year can spike above the, the, the two-year. Yeah, but here's the problem with the two-year. It closely tracks whatever the Fed is saying that they're going to do. Correct. Right. Which means if they do cut rates, the two-year most likely comes down. And even if the 10-year comes down a little bit, you're still going to see upward pressure as confidence in the long end begins to creep up. Got it. Got you. And I know it's a bit more technical or more nuanced than we get into, and I'm not doing a good job of explaining how kind of how the mechanisms work here. Let me give you a more relatable example. Okay. Let's jump into the chart of the day. Average rate for U.S. savings account. Yeah. From CNBC. So you've seen savings accounts jump pretty incredibly. Now, on this chart, there are several dotted lines. Once again, Said is colorblind, so I'm not going to waste the time getting into that. Basically, the dotted lines represent Fed meetings. Okay. The red ones represent, I believe, no interest rate increase. And the blue ones represent interest rate increases. Arun, did I read that right? I'm not seeing a description of... Yeah, I don't see a description. Yeah, no the dashed lines dash mark is. the U.S. It's the part where the description's at the bottom there. Oh, okay. Well, it means, okay. There you go. Red dashes are meetings when rates are increased. Okay, yes. so there you go. So rates increase in the red lines. No, Nothing was uh, done on the blue lines. And for those of you who are driving, every single red line had an increase in U.S. saving accounts on average happen afterward. Yeah, why did... But then banks needed to do that. Right. So their cost of funds, their cost of borrow went up. Mm -hmm. right? So if I'm going to borrow from, from the bank, I can be more competitive and pay you more for deposit rates to get your money in as long as it's cheaper than my otherwise cost of funds somewhere else. Right. So as the cost of funds raise for the banks, they're trying to get money wherever they can. So if I, if I can borrow from the interbank system for 5.4%, if I give you 5.25%, yes. I'm still money good. Exactly. That's, an, it, that's the cheapest money in the market right now for, for me to get is your money at that rate. Right. And banks need to do that to, you know, keep their customers happy and have their money stay at the bank so they can continue to lend on it. So what's really important here is, is this is where people have put their money as of late, is they put their money into cash because you're paying, you're getting average interest rates that are pretty high. Rune, what's the average interest rate for the U.S. savings account there? It's a really, really small font there. Do you, do you see it? The top right of the chart, May 13th. Or March 13th? 0.58%. Thank you. Yeah. Rune, are you even playing here today? Well, I'm trying to open the chart. I couldn't see it either. Yeah. The Fed hasn't touched interest rates since July. Okay? Right. But they're still moving. In this case, they're actually increasing on average because now you've got several months, two years, essentially, of Fed interest rate increases. So the weighted average interest rate portfolio is moving up. But that percentage, that point, what was it? 0 0.58. 0 0.58. That is low on average. That's taking everybody who's got high yields and you know, and their and their interest bearing deposits, non interest bearing deposits. It's it's a bit of a, a quandary. But if you go to the next chart, the average rate for twelve month certificates, CDs, mm -hmm. deposit in the US. Yeah. That's a much higher number, one point eight one percent. Yes. You'll see it's on the decline now. It's yeah, it's coming back down. Yeah. It peaked in about was it April? Uh yeah, maybe January, February. January, February, somewhere there. Mm -hmm. It peaked, and now it's on the way down. And the reason why this is happening is banks have said, okay, we anticipate rate cuts this year. Right. 
So because we know rates are going to be moving down, cost our cost of funds to go down, we're going to make sure that we don't lock in higher interest rates. Because this is 12 months. 12 months. So what they did is they lowered their 12-month CDs and increased their 9-month CDs so that they can reduce their overall cost over time. Right. Chris, what the hell does this matter with bonds? Yeah, why does this matter, Chris? As the return for 12-month, one-year duration CDs drops, the bond market now looks much more attractive because it's paying more over a longer duration. Yeah, it makes sense because, you know, this is and this is advice that we've been, you know, saying or doing, giving out on the podcast is like the, the right thing to do right now is to hold your cash. Make sure you put it into a savings account. Yeah. Right. Because it was giving you, you know, some accounts were giving you up to like 5%. For 2022, it was definitive. Holding cash was one of your best returning assets. Yeah, because if let's just say the stock market on average gives you a return of somewhere between 7 to 10 percent. Right. Let's just be conservative. Let's just say call it 7 percent. Are you really going to risk putting your money into the stock market to get seven percent when you can get a guaranteed five percent in the savings account? Like that was the when was the last time that happened? So let me boil this down in non-technical speak, in a way that's relatable and digestible for everybody. Okay, you will always hear talk of bonds, of CDs, of stocks, of real estate. And there are all sorts of different ways to compare them. Capitalization rates, market cap, and all these things people will point to. At the end of the day, the game is this simple. The only thing you're doing is moving your money in the place that will give you the best return at the time. And as the market shifts, if you're cognizant of enough of those shifts, mm -hmm. you move your money into a better place for a better return. If you're a busy working professional, that's hard to do which is why we tell people to go into low-cost index funds and to avoid playing this game. However, institutions, large companies that hold a lot of cash, think of people like Apple, think of people like Amazon, they're holding all this cash they put in the banking system. When they pivot their money into things like cash in the form of CDs or bonds, they're moving the needle there as well. There's also wealth advisory firms that have cash. There's all sorts of people that are playing cash strategies beyond the retail consumer, they're really moving the needle here at an institutional level. Right. Which is why you see a wide difference in just your average operating account, your your average interest rate, interest bearing accounts and their interest rate versus the CD accounts. Got it. Different vehicles for different things. Right. The last chart we have here is the average <laughs> credit card for APRs uh, in uh, average credit card APRs in the US, 20.75%. Damn, that's a swift kick in the ding ding. That's the average APR in the U.S. Yeah, I want to say pre-pandemic levels were like sixteen percent. Yeah, I mean March twenty twenty three was at nineteen point nine. So yeah. to give you an idea. It's been it's been increasing. Yeah, but this has increased at a much faster cadence all the way until about September this year, mm -hmm. and, and since then it's slowed down. Mind you, coming at a time when balances are hitting all time highs. One point one three trillion. Yeah, yeah, it's a problem. Yeah, people are having to use them just to make ends meet. Um, yeah, man, I don't, I don't. Do you see APRs for credit cards coming down when the Fed does cut rates? I'm so sorry, I'm a sniffling, man. It's, I, I'm so sick. No, it doesn't. Um, matter. do I see APRs coming down? Yeah, I think it will. But the problem for most Americans is if you're paying twenty percent interest, you're not really paying it down. You're not getting out of it. One of the one of my followers uh, on LinkedIn. You know, I, I would I want to pause here actually, uh, just for a brief moment. I've been getting hit up by so many people on so many different platforms talking about, hey, the last episode is great. The show was great. And the last episode, and this has largely been your constructive feedback, the way you've changed the episodes, mm. the way we go into things, and some of the, the that's all been you. That, you know, I'll give you credit where it's due. It's really cool to see people I don't know that are not like in my network yeah. hit me up and be like, hey, man, like, I really like the show. I heard you say this. And I just want to say thank you. Because, yeah. I mean, without them, and some of these people, we, the people that are, the show started off with our friends and family, and, and now that it's gotten to a point where these people will hit you up and be like, hey, I really like this, you know, and they reach out and connect, that's really cool, man. It is really cool. I actually got some of them here that I think is worth reading. Um, as a young 20-year-old, I really enjoy how relatable and simple you guys make the show. The show is informative, yet still entertaining. It's either that or I'm just some 24-year-old finance nerd. Either way, love you guys. You're not a nerd. You're a genius ahead of your time. <laughs> You're a sophisticated aristocrat. We love you, bro. We love you very much. Yeah. Give me some other one. Fluffy Doughboy. That was the name. Sounds like an aristocrat to me. <laughs> yeah. Fluffy uh, Doughboy. 
Loving the financial tips at the top of the show. Fantastic change. Wanted to ask. Investing is top of my mind as of late. Debt-free and looking to diversify my finances and grow my current savings. Though I appreciate what to invest in, how do I do this? You said Vanguard or E-Trade account. I'm a visual learner and would love to see how to create and start one of these accounts. I appreciate any and all help. Blessings to you both for making me laugh and learn at the same time. Do we tease it? Uh, yeah, I, I think you, I think you give him just a tip. <laughs> just, just a tip. Just a tip for right now, and then TIP. Yeah, then the whole thing later on. Yeah, I didn't know that Ti. His name was his nickname was Tip. Tip, yeah. And then there was I think there was a diss track that came out where I think Ludacris dissed him, calling the tip of my you know what, and then. He's had to change. T- he, cha- he chose I to change. I do not the TI. know what. Can you clarify what he was referencing in that? I, I know we track? have an explicit rating, but this sound feels a little vulgar for me, even for me. I got to be honest. All the phallic jokes come from me. <laughs> You're on it. Wow. You need to get sick more often. You got, um, did you take some truth serum? I did. Yeah. Said came up with a brilliant idea, which uh, he messaged me in a uh, enthusiastic rapid text fire message i did i was it it wasn't structured at all no it wasn't structured at all i was in a meeting going like jesus christ like i was was like i'll read it later jesus i was like i got an idea you gotta do this we're gonna do this we do that and oh my god it's like oh my god and i'm like holy shit yeah um but it was a good idea so to respond to uh our friend here who's a visual learner we have a way uh to prove out what we're saying is not only an effective technique but we have a way to show you visually we have a way to keep you engaged, and we have a way that you and us, as a team, can do something together and make money together. Right. This is somewhat of a uh, tip of the cap uh, or pay homage to uh, Warren Buffett and the, the gang over there. Yeah. We're going to be betting on this, and hopefully you guys enjoy it and are you know tune in for the ride. Hopefully we'll do that. We'll debut that on next week's episode. But uh, not next, not when they get this. So like, it'll be two weeks from now, right? Because this uh, yeah. next week's up, this one comes out next week. Today, for the reference point, it is Tuesday, March twenty sixth. Yeah. So not this following Tuesday, because you'll get this episode, but the one after this, you should, you should get that. Everyone's pulling up a calendar right after I've already named the dates. That's that's very right. useful. Yeah. Right. I appreciate it. He's yeah. proactive tonight. He's he's, you, he's getting out in front of it. He's trying. He's Jamie Light tonight. Yeah. 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 yeah Although, Rich Boy keeps complaining. No, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> complaining. Boy. Look, I missed several weeks. Sorry, Top taking, Boy. They, that's that's the appropriate thank you yeah it's scientifically proven now i've got a full scan yes yeah, sir thick a lot it basically has an end result where it says you are fat sir <laughs> their poor doctor looked at you and was like enough's enough and i'm like look you know what else is fat these home prices that's a questionable segue <laughs> <laughs> he's doing it for hefe for hefe for half yeah while inflation is 10 times higher now than 60 years ago, home prices are actually 24 times more expensive, a new study found. This according to CNBC. Mm. If home prices increased at the same rate as inflation since 1963, the median price of a typical house in the United States would be $177,511, according to new research by Clever. A real estate data company. Great name. A solid name. Yeah, that's very clever. That's staying in their lane. Yeah. Like, don't be Redfin. No, why? No, we like, not, we, but we like them. No, I know, but that name is complete dog shit. No, no, they're friends. <laughs> yeah, and they are friends, but the name is terrible. Yeah, I got data from them, too, coming right Continuing after Continuing on, Arun, I need you to scroll down a little bit while I do this. Thank you. In reality, the cost of a typical house in the U.S. is closer to half a million dollars. The median price for a home in the U.S., is $412,778, according to new Redfin data. Mm -hmm. Reliable data, but terrible name. Yeah. Today, it's harder for adults to buy homes than it was for their parents' generation, said Matt Brennan. (laughs) Brennan. (laughs) Brennan. A data writer at Clever uh, and the author of the report. Damn, they couldn't give him the title of chief economist? The data writer? Yeah, that Dude, is, that's that kind of that's, that dick, a, light. that's yeah. a dick move, bro. That is a little respect adjacent. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. Just make him yeah. an, an economist over at Clever. Why gotta be data writer? Matt, we respect your writing. And um, we think you write well about data. Bro. But an economist, you are not. You can't make 
Hey, there he is. Hey, we're pulling him up. This guy, it looks like a stud. He can't be director of data. Like, come on, make him something. What's going on here? Matt Brennan is a data writer at Clever Real Estate, the nation's leading real estate educational platform for home buyers, sellers, and investors, who obviously does not like economists. Before joining Clever, Matt worked as a journalist for Reading.com, mm. where his coverage earned California Journalism Awards for in-depth reporting investigative reporting, writing. Oh, it's because he's not an economist. Bro, he's a, he's, he went to USC. That's the homie for you. Yeah, I know, but, like, but it's, it's, it, that wasn't a knock on him. He, he's literally an, a journalist. But he, he, he's his journalistic skill is around data analysis, which is confusing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, Matt, I hope you don't hear this. Yeah, someone's going to send to him. I can't believe we didn't get any hate from the realtors out there. Real tour, yeah, real real tour. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Fuck. I said it. Real tour. Yeah, no what are we doing? Yeah. We have no respect. We're yeah. respecting Jason here. We yeah. covered <laughs> that. Respecting yeah. Jason. <laughs> we got no hate. I kind of, I kind of came at them a little hard on the last one. The settlement? No, not the settlement. The fact that you know the steering. You know how many social media posts I've I've seen lately going? You know, we here at name your real estate firm. We're not worried about the. <laughs> repricing circumstances. We're just trying to stay in our lane and focus on providing value for our clients. Yeah. And because we know we can provide value, we're not concerned with this. So don't worry about changing the paradigm. Worry about providing value to your clients because they'll pay your fees for that. I'm like, bitch, please. Mm. You need to be concerned. Yeah, man. This is the beginning. Of, this is a tsunami, and you're seeing the waves pull back, and you're going to say, we're not worried here at uh, Laguna Beach of a pending tsunami. Yeah, the waves are going out, and it looks like a tsunami could be hitting us. But we're really working on providing a great visitor experience. I can, you know what I can see? I can see um, the the bigger institutions really profiting off this. Oh, so I, a listener who hit me up today said something, and I have to research this. But he said that uh, in Australia, Australia, uh, they don't actually have as much of a realtor-like presence there. That they they pre predominantly drive off of the sales platforms. Like they have their equivalent of like Zillow and Redfin. There is actually where the majority of the transactions happen. Okay. So I want to look into that in a future episode, uh, and I do want to cover this kind of home price crash article from uh, the Kobisi letter here coming up. But um, that that'd be an interesting kind of foreshadowing of what could happen. So, you, you, let's let's just put let's put Zillow and Redfin aside. I could see a world where you know Berkshire Hathaway, right? Their agents there. I can easily see them be like, all right, you got to take in this this many buyers, you know, and charge them a really low fee, and then you you get leads on to sellers, right? I can easily see a world where that happens. Give me a little more color. So, for instance, like, uh, so if. Right now, sellers aren't having to pay buyers' commissions, right? right? And the agent for the buyer has to negotiate, you know, what their fee is going to be up front, right? Yeah. Charge a really low flat fee for, you know, for buying the property. Oh, yeah. You're just talking about moving more, like, volume-based. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like kind of like, you know, like any business that you're trying to scale. You know, you do, you do a lot of free work up front early, and yeah. then you get paid out really on the back end later. Well, and this is – so every single D-bag who sells something – like, you know, on social media and they offer like a low cost or low ticket buy-in. Yeah. What they're really paying for is they're paying for your email address or your contact information. Exactly. And they might spend a hundred thousand dollars selling you some $3 or $5 tchotchke. Right. Mm -hmm. And they may earn back like 90 or 80,000, but they basically got tons of leads for 20 or ten thousand dollars easy money right and they already know a majority of the people out there like oh that company took care of me last time now i'm just going to go through them this time and just and accept that cost now going into it because they took care of me on the last deal right but that, that is 100 percent the way the real estate world and commissions are going to go yeah and i know that people are going to disagree and they're going to be all sorts of salty about that but uh allow me to express my uh respect adjacent thoughts on this <laughs> i don't fucking care <laughs> Respect to Jason, so good. Yeah, put some respect on my name. Yeah, adjacent to it anyway. Like, like Kobisi. So the Kobisi letter, breaking news. According to the Kobisi letter, obviously this was breaking news several days ago because we don't report in real time, kids. We report in real time. Yeah, it's our time. Yeah, it's our time. You know my time right now. You know our time is an, a dating website for old people, right? No, it's not. 
Yeah. Our, our time? time. Yeah. Like, how do you like, spell it? Our time. Our? O U O. Yeah. R. No, you said our. Our. Our time. You're not. You're not gonna do this right Dude, now. Our. <laughs> I normally would talk I mean, shit. You said our time. Here, I'm like, is it rated? Is it rated our time? When like, I do what's going on? when I do the thumbnails, I use Captionator. I use this AI generated tool to help take our our voices and uh, make a visual representation in the form of you know, sub sub captions. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. And uh, when I do the captions of the videos, for somehow you always come off very clearly. Uh, translated and i come off sounding like a complete jackass why i my voice sucks dude it, it's so deep that it like all the words mesh together i don't enunciate i don't know you got a good podcast voice though I, you would think so but not according to ai no ai likes you okay yeah it is not like me thank you ai new home prices are now down 20 percent from their highs key point here to differentiate these are new Homes that are being built, brought to the market, not existing homes. Right. Anytime someone talks about ho housing data, you should typically hear of that as being the key differentiator. New homes delivered to the market, homes that are being built and delivered to the market to solve the supply and demand inventory issue. Right. Versus existing homes in the market that are being sold from people leaving them and moving out. Right. So, And just to recap off what uh, the last article Chris touched on, just so we can compare the two. He said, this is from Redfin, median sale price came in at $412,000, right? Yes. That's up 6.5% 12 months ago, a yeah. year ago. Year, that's year over year. So median sale price of all homes, up 6.5%. Okay, but this is saying new homes. Yeah. So, and that's how data can be manipulated, kids. This is the Dave Ramsey school. You know, we're going to focus on the, uh, the 6% up increase in the sales information. We're not going to look at things that might portray a negative image right. of what it is we're trying to say. Yeah. Well, uh, let's give you the other side of the coin here. So new home prices down 20% from their highs in bear market territory. Bear market, not good market. Bull market, good market. Bear market, sad market. Okay. Yeah, explain the, explain the difference between the two. A bull is aggressive. We'll poke you right in the ass. A bear, aggressive, but we'll scratch you. Yeah, like, like a bitch. A bull's gonna hit yeah. you up, and a bear's gonna swipe down. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, it's relatable. And it's falling faster than rates seen in 2008, according to Reventure, one of our favorite data sources. New home prices peaked in late 2022 at 497 thousand whopping dollars, and have fallen to 401 thousand. As of the latest data. Now, you can see that, right? If the median sale price of a home is going to be $412,000, yep. right? Then a price of a new home should be higher than that. Should be. Right. But now? Not so much. Not so much. Which, in my mind, foreshadows, kids. Uh, in the financial crisis, new home prices dropped by 23% from 2007 to 2010, according to ReVenture. Now, we're seeing an already 20% drop from 2022 to now. Imagine how much more room you have down to go. Yeah, for this is this really hurts the the home builders, right? It does yeah. We are down roughly the same amount in just 1.5 years or half of the time. Yeah, man. Still new home sales prices are down 20% above pre-pandemic levels and existing home supply is near record lows. Is the housing market beginning to crack? Well, kids, according to this sexy chart that room put up, and I know you can't see. Uh, all charts have a squiggly up and down when you look at them real close. And when you zoom out. Peaks and valleys. Peaks and valleys go away and it's just straight lines up. And this chart would have you going mostly up until the Great Recession where there was a spike downward. And while there is intermittent ups and downs in between, it's it pretty much rose steadily all the way up until 2022. And now you're seeing a dramatic drop off. From that four hundred ninety-seven thousand dollar number down to four hundred one k, tantamount to obviously what we talked about earlier, twenty twenty-two, but certainly on a trajectory almost as fast as the rise from twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty-two, and that should be concerning. It should definitely be concerning. So you know, we, uh, earlier we talked about Jay Powell at the post-game press conference, and one of the reporters asked him, you know, with housing data and what's coming out. Clearly, we said it's up now six and a half percent. You know, from twelve months ago. Right, yeah. Uh, median sale price of all homes. Um, they said, "How does this fit into the inflation picture?" We know that housing makes up a majority of inflation, right? Thirty-four percent, if you're looking at CPI. 
And he said, we're confident that we think we can get inflation down to 2% even if housing doesn't come down. And I was looking at him like, the fuck are you talking about, dude? It ain't getting hit 2% if housing doesn't come down. Yeah, I don't really understand. Like, are you how, buying the crock they, of shit? Like, what are you saying? I don't buy crocs of shit, Said. You do buy crocs of shit. You have crocs that are shit. I have several pairs of crocs. I even have the Shalai Minberries. <laughs> they got names? They look like fingerprints. What are those? Those are the special limited. You know what? I know that you feel like you're deep in the shoe game. I'm not. I'm not. Although I do want some Air Max ones, I think that's what I'm craving right now. Air Dude, Max I'm ones. telling you, Air Max ones are the ways to go. The ways? Yeah, that's way. the ways. And yet somehow AI understands what you say more than <laughs> it's me. It's the way, it, bro. It's, it's astonishing. It's the way, Air Max one. Arun, I know that we've missed you and we've we've been giving you a little bit of shit this episode, but uh, the show's not the same without you, bud. Thank you, sir. I'm so, googling Air Max ones right now. <laughs> <laughs> if you gotta honestly. If a listener messaged me and said, I don't know what Air Max ones look like, I'm like, we can't be friends. You know the pair for Air Max Day is going to be uh, white, like a kind of like a tealish blue and uh, like a neon, like bolt color. Mm. Uh, and they're coming God, they're in like a so special package. They're so sexy, man. Yeah. I, love, I love them so much that I even want their golf shoe. That's going to be my next gym shoe, I think. I, I was rolling with Air Max 90s uh, for the last couple months there mm-hmm. for the gym shoe, but it's starting to get worn out. And I think uh, this, uh, the the bubble in the Air Max 1s, um, they, they use the same long bubble for the Air Max 4s. I, I mean, sorry, for the Jordan 4s. That's where they got the inspo from. It doesn't strike me as a surprise at all that you think that's long. <laughs> Was so that two stupid. inches? You're so, Inch? you're so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, just, it's an interesting choice of words. How do you get there? How did you get there? <laughs> you said it was a long bubble, and I'm looking at it going, it looks so petite. Something to keep in mind is for housing. Housing inventory right now, 1.4 million homes. Looks like a baby's finger. Okay. There are 1.4 million homes listed for sale. Like a newborn baby. Uh, Pre-pandemic, it was over 2 million homes for sale. Okay. So that's approximately 40% more when compared to today. Right? So I'm really interested. Chris mentioned that he thinks that there's going to be upward pressure on the 10-year. Look, if, if there just happens to be downward pressure, and some of these people are right, What's going to happen to home prices if the 10 year comes down? Oh, it's it you we're going to have inch mortgage rates fall down, right? Which by the way, we're still well below the historical average 8% mortgage rate, right? No, but but we talk about it. We can't we can't do that. That's wrong because wages haven't kept up. So you can't say we can't it it would be negligent on our part to not also bring that up. No, it's true. 100% is true. Look, if you have a spike in the home market from here, which I mean theoretically I guess you could. Um I'd be very worried about what happens next. And that's the question I've had for so many housing economists. Um, I, I truly don't understand the, the, okay, so let me, let me paint a picture for you. For a long time, existing home sales were leading the way in, in volume because you can't deliver supply to the market fast enough in new home sales to meet the demand. And people would often sell a lot more existing home sales and they would new home sales because of that. But then people went, shit, I don't want to get in these bidding wars on these existing home sales going through, you know, open houses, all these things. I'd rather just go to a new home builder, put in my money and buy a home because at least that way I can avoid this, you know, fuck around and find out bidding process. So to Chris's point in 2021, 2022, 55 to 60% of sales we're above list. Yeah. Which is crazy. Currently, this is the one good data point that's coming out right now in the housing market. They're currently back down to 25%, which I know seems high, one out of every four. But that's approximately around pre-pandemic numbers. Yeah, that's about a, that's about, about right. average. That's that's going to happen. That's about right, yeah. Yeah. yeah people have, you know, desirable homes. That, that That's what happens. But here's the problem, though, is if when people shifted into the new housing market, they were like, okay, you know what? I'm willing to pay a premium because I don't have to do this bidding. Now they're saying, I'm not willing, I'm actually willing to pay a discount to the average home price to buy this new home sale, right. this new home. Mm-hmm. So to me, this leading the way is foreshadowing what existing home sales should do as well. Because there should be somewhat of an equilibrium. I and mean, people should be, in, in general, be willing to pay more on average for new home sales. Now that could be some of the stock, and I haven't looked at the data here to, to, that's behind this with the reventure, but that could be some of the housing stock is more affordable housing, which is really what we need anyway. Mm-hmm. But I would venture to guess that's not that's not the case. Got it. So, 
Mm. It's been a long show. We're about an hour and 18 minutes in. Hopefully you're still around. Uh, and for those of you who are still around, we love you. We appreciate you. We need you. And um, You know who needs you more right now is Diddy. <laughs> yeah. This guy, is, is he going away? I, 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 there is a, what's shocking to me that, why didn't we get more coverage in the traditional media on this? I'm not sad about it. Is that bad? Am I a bad person? But did he go away? Yeah. I'm not sad about it at all. I'm Fuck not, him. I'm honestly, I've never been a fan, really. Never. I want to see all the sex tapes of, of him. <laughs> like, Be being careful. Taken, be careful. Would you, yeah, finish that sentence. No, of him being taken advantage of. Because you know they're out oh, there. Oh, I was going to say. Like, you know he's paid to be on the receiving end. Because he's he might have some sex tapes of him I doing some things. I want all those leakers out there to leak him. Yeah. You know what? Because... The stuff that he's been accused of doing and, you know, in the like the Cassie stuff. Like, I don't know if you read the lawsuits. I, I did because I read lawsuits. So wildly, just extremely inappropriate. Let me tell you, man. When when they pull up in the in the black trucks and the black cars and they rage the house, yeah. it's over for you. Okay? There is there's no explaining. It, it's game over. Yeah, dude. They don't. 50 Cent was been been trolling him for a long time right there's, there's yeah. historic beef here he's laughing now right oh dude he posted he's like look let me be honest <laughs> he's the best the fbi don't raid your house on suspicion no it's over they, yeah like they, they figured they, it they, out they didn't come to your house because they think they may got something they got something bro yeah but here's the question though also like i mean this is not new this has been going around for a long time like if people knew about this how did everyone just keep it under wraps I mean, do I really need to go here? Yeah. Um, what do you mean? Of course. Bro, there was a fucking island people were flying pedophiles to. Well, that's, but that, yeah, but that's that a little, Jeffrey Epstein had an entire fucking no, yeah, like yeah, yeah, but that's human different. Ponzi scheme going on. That's different. That's For different, fucking right? decades, dude. You're, you get, you're, you're, you're talking about the elite. You're talking about the elite and like literally the. You what know, do you think Puff Daddy or Diddy or whatever the fuck he calls himself was for certain Okay, here's, here's, the difference, here's the difference between them. Okay, come on. The parties that Diddy was hosting. All right, they, there's got to be some fast, loose mouths at those parties. That's sexual. You, didn't do, you do that on purpose. <laughs> you do that on purpose. That, that's not fair. Don't do that to me. Come on, it's fucked up. You can't be making jokes like this right now, Chris. You say fast, loose mouths. Nobody what does that said mean? that. What does that mean? So you can say people who got big mouths. I mean, hey, that's different. That's... <laughs> oh, so accurate. Hey, but you you hey, went with two, you went with two adjectives, hey. fast and loose. <laughs> fast, loose. That's a saying, bro. Don't no, put, you're taunting don't, me at that point. Don't okay, put that shit on me. You're taunting me. That's what you're doing. If you would have said, you know, he's got a big mouth, I'd be like, okay, that's a slip. When you say he got a big dirty mouth, that's that's intentional. <laughs> Come on, man. I would say the people that are attending these parties, not all of them are uh, reputable. Okay. Wow, that's racist. What do you mean? What's what racist about it? Would, would P. Diddy all can't races, have some reputable friends? All races are going to these parties. Uh, P. Diddy can't have reputable friends? What does that no, mean? No, sure he does. But some of the people that are being invited, come on, man. What are, you know this. It's not the same thing. You're talking about government officials or people that are so entrenched in the government with the Epstein Island, okay? And then now you're going to compare those people to people that are attending Diddy's party? Yeah. Those are, nah, come on. Stop. You want a great example? Look at our national deficit. What does that These mean? are high-ranking politicians. What do you mean? They don't care. Okay. They don't care about the national deficit. Brian thing. Moynihan. <laughs> oh, he didn't go to Epstein. Let, let's be honest. Let, no, let's I don't put that out there. Don't put that out there. I'm not there. But I'm saying, like, he's a, a person of perceived power that you would say would not go to a Diddy party, right? 100%. And you're saying he's a different quality of human being? No, no, I'm not saying he's a different quality of human being. I'm saying... I got to be honest. I would not want to be in a locker room alone with Brian Moynihan. Okay. The, first of all, the, no, I wouldn't either. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> Hold on. Mm. Neither would I. But that's just not, that's a completely different game. Although the similar things were happening, right, at, at both places. So I'm just shocked that it took this long. It's always shocking that it takes this long. What crazy, it was crazy. Or, like, about or like Weinstein, what, right? The, the movie director guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like why did that take so long? Well, so I have experience in Hollywood around his like cadence of fame. Holy cow. So, like, I mean, parties at Brett Ratner's house and some of these guys, like some of the stuff that you saw that industry in, the, in my short limited exposure to it, where we did some production stuff and we did all that stuff. And, and I, I would really like to spend some time talking to Alejandro Solomon about this. We talked, we went through lunch with him. We talked about this a little bit. Yeah, man. So dude, by the way, that industry is just fuck wild. It's crazy. And he's such, he's just such a cool guy. Ali. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, he likes me a whole lot more than Wait, you. hold on. You're, you guys are cool like that? Don't call yeah, him Ali. Ali tight, Don't call bro. him Ali. No, we're, I mean. You're not tight like that. No, we're just fast and loose mouths. You know, he's not loose. No, he's not he's loose. A, he's not got loose mouth. He's, 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 he's good. He's, he's right on the corner for me now. Yeah, stud. Yeah. I mean, he still never sees the see Stud. Each other. Got the cyber truck. He did. He's been, he's fucking every day he posts photos of that thing. Yeah, smart. I'm like, you've got fucking hyper cars, bro. Yeah. He's like, I love this truck. Yeah. I'm like, you have hyper cars. He's like, I know. I love the truck. That's cool. It's weird. Yeah. All right. Well, um, if you've stood by and listened to us and our perverted rantings, uh, let me leave you with this one thing. I uh, am disappointed in the U.S. government that these things take so long, but it couldn't happen to a bigger piece of shit. So I hope he goes down in the prize. Yeah. Uh, likewise. Um, make sure to support the show. Head over to transcendcompany.com slash THSP. Contact somebody over there. Like, make sure they can take care of you. They got a lot of good stuff over there for longevity. And even though if you think that it, they may not, I bet you they do. Give them a try. That was awkward. Health and wellness. And for the record, I was fatter before Transcend. Yeah, this is yeah, this is the improved version. It's <laughs> the getting, improved version. It's get, it's getting better. A visceral fat so high. <laughs> oh, dude, you got anything else? Please end this. <laughs> no. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>